Rob Dubay, welcome to the L3 Leadership Podcast. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So much I want to dive into. Um, but I want to go way back to the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey. I believe you began selling lollipops. Is that correct? How you started? Yes, it's correct. And I, I who knew that story was going to have legs? Uh, but, <laughs> you know, the reason that uh, we share that or I share that is because it's so relatable to so many entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, they've either done something like that or they know somebody very close to them that has. So my best friend and I started selling blow pop lollipops out of our locker in ninth grade. And that's when we got pinged with this idea of entrepreneurship. And then all through high school and college, we continue to have all kinds of crazy different types of businesses. And once you know it, right out of college, we started our first business and ran it for a good 30 years. Um, wow. And so here we are today. Yeah. Can you just give us context for what the company was and then what are you doing with your life now just so our audience gets Absolutely. to know you a little bit? So the company is called Image One and it provides managed print services to companies all over the uh, country, uh, the United States. And so that means we provide multifunction printers and copiers under contract with those companies and help them to be more efficient, save money. Uh, my business partner, who is also happens to be most importantly, my bestest friend in the entire world. Um, and yes, we were in business for 30 years and are still the bestest of friends, <laughs> <laughs> but we've had our moments. Um, okay. But while we're still the um, only two shareholders in the company, um, we have somebody who's running the company for us. So it's a self-managed mm. company now. Yeah. And what wow. I'm doing with my life now is I partnered up with a good, good, dear, dear friend of mine by the name of Gino Wickman, who is very well known for a best-selling book called Traction and a process that he created called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And the two of us are bringing um, two uh, pieces of content to the world. We are teachers by nature, and uh, we are teaching entrepreneurs and leaders the 10 disciplines for managing and maximizing uh, their energy. And we teach early stage entrepreneurs how to increase their chances for success through our eLeap Academy. So that's the, it's uh, E standing for Entrepreneurial Leap Academy. Wow. Well, I definitely want to dive into that a little bit. Um, for those listening, I'm sure I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but uh, we run mastermind groups. And a few years ago, Traction, someone recommended Traction and then every every it was required reading for everyone. That's how it and works, every, right? <laughs> that's, I mean, I, I, can, I cannot name a better book for how to lead and manage an organization. Yeah. Um, but when I went through it, uh, we were just talking before we jumped on the podcast. Um, I've tried self-implementing the principles in Traction for five or six years in my organization. And it's gotten a little bit of traction. Uh, but all of a sudden, my buddies uh, who own a, a few companies uh, said, hey, we actually tried self-implementing. That didn't actually work out so well. We hired implementers to help us actually uh, implement the operating system within our organization. And it changed everything. Uh, so at our nonprofit, we recently decided to engage an implementer. And uh, we just started the process. But literally, we've had our two focus days. And just those two days alone, I feel like we've made more progress than, uh, <laughs> than me trying to self-implement implement for five years. So, um, so for, for people who don't know what that is, can you talk about EOS Traction? And specifically, I, I believe very early on, Gino came into your life with some of these principles and it changed yes. the, the trajectory of your company. Can you tell that? Yeah. Story? Well, just for context, the way that Gino and I met is uh, my business partner and I had acquired a company early on in our business career and uh, it wasn't going so well. <laughs> and somebody recommended that maybe Gino could uh, be a good sounding board for us. At the time, he was just getting going with a quote unquote consulting business. And he was teaching companies basically how to run on EOS, but it wasn't even called that back then. And so through that conversation, we uh, started to uncover a a lot of problems that we had with just with the way we were running the business. And so we engaged with Gino to take us through the process and he became our official implementer, which again, it wasn't called that back then. And so we worked with him and with, uh, we worked with him for a number of years and really mastered, um, having the entrepreneurial operating system as part of our business. 
I, it was so successful and that we were approached by a public company in our industry and they were interested in acquiring our company and we sold it to them. Um, wow. Joel and I, uh, my best friend and business partner, uh, we stayed on for 18 months. Um, and at that time they had some leadership changeovers and uh, they gave the company back to us. So that was lucky. Um, but the reason I like to share that story is that if we weren't running on the entrepreneurial operating system, we would not have been approached by that company and we would not have received the multiple that we received. They told us wow. many times that it was because of the way we were running the business that they felt so comfortable in making that acquisition. One more point I'd like to make is many people like yourself um, reach out to me and I have no stake in EOS, just so you know, <laughs> I'm just a huge okay. fan because of the impact that it's had on my life and my business, my other business. Um, but, you know, many people reach out to me asking, you know, should I self implement? Should I have an implementer? So on and so forth. You already answered the question the way I would answer it. So I won't go through that again. But yes, I, I do. I am a big proponent of bringing in somebody to help you implement this properly into your organization. And at some point, they'll let you fly on your own. But in the meantime, you'll, you'll accelerate your getting up to speed with the process. Yeah, and we've been talking about traction, and, and basically, it's a way to operate and run your organization. Could you provide like a concise summary, maybe of of all of traction, or at least what was most impactful about the processes that made a difference as you guys were leading that company? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that many businesses and organizations know is what are your core values? I mean, just as simple as that, and getting really clear about that. Oftentimes, when companies uh, uh, start to do that, they start to look around and say, holy smokes, like we don't have the right people in the right seats, which is another very important component of the EOS process is making sure you have the right people in the right seats. That's the people component. There's the process component. And that means, you know, do you have strong processes in all aspects of your businesses? And is it being followed by everybody? So there's another really strong point. Um, what's your vision? You know, where are you going? There's a tool that EOS uses called the Vision Traction Organizer. It's a very simple tool, Doug. I know you're familiar with it by now. Yeah, and you, you almost look at it and you go, really? This is it? <laughs> you know, it's not this gigantic <laughs> strategic plan, you know, but it just keeps everything so simple and right at your fingertips. And so for those of you that aren't familiar, it's basically a two page document. That, that shares your core values, your core, um, your, your uh, now I'm going to forget the second part, your tenure, you know, where you're going in 10 years, your marketing process, your three-year plan, your one-year plan, and uh, your 90-day rocks, and then an ongoing um, list of what your issues are, because those never end. And so there's another really important component of EOS, and I only scratched the surface there, and I'm certainly not on their sales team, so I know I could that didn't do the best job, but hopefully, you know, that gives a, a little bit of idea of, of how important uh, or how impactful uh, the EOS process could be for your business. Yeah, I know. I think I heard you on another podcast. I, I want you to dive into this a little bit. You mentioned core values, and it sounds like we had similar experiences. Me and a friend actually almost started. Uh, we hired the same implementer and two different organizations, uh, both going through the process around the same time. And it sounds like when we were going into the day where you focus on core values, we both came in with the mentality of like, we already have our organization's core values set. We know what they are. We're good. We don't even need to go over this. <laughs> and then we go to the day and basically we spent like half of the day talking through. Can you talk about core values and organizations and, and maybe an aha that you got from that process? Oh my God, for sure. Like I'll never forget that. I can picture exactly where we were and exactly <laughs> what was happening. And I was really irritated because I did feel like we had clarity there and I just didn't want to spend time on it. I came in all, you know, jazzed up to like really get through a bunch of meaty issues. And Gino just said, Hey, will you give me some blind faith on this? You know, and, and we went through half the day, I think even longer, to be honest with you. <laughs> and we just tore it apart. You know, and it was the best exercise we ever did, you know, because they really do guide you. And, I, you know, to what degree your audience um, just stop me because I don't know to what degree your audience 
you know, really embraces core values. I think most companies at this point or organizations say, yeah, we need that. And you can put them on the wall and on your website and so on and so forth. But are they really guiding you? Like, are you pausing throughout your day to say, like, here's a vendor relationship and, hmm. and they, we're not in alignment. So they have the best price. It's going to increase our margins but there's something out of alignment with our values. So are you willing to walk away from that? Because that's what your values are there for. Obviously, I mentioned before, people, you know, within the organization, and just that's so important. How many times as entrepreneurs, as leaders of organizations, do we have somebody who just has the greatest skills? Like they're so awesome at sales or at finance or whatever it is. And you just see in your mind how they can lift you up as an organization, but somehow they're missing a couple of those really key core values. I mean, they're all key, but they're missing a couple. And how many times do we kind of let it slide only to have it come, at, come back and bite us like eight months down the line where you're like, oh, I knew that person could sell, but they are ruining our culture. So you just really have to embrace those values and you have to live by them. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And again, I probably don't have to say this, but leaders, if you're listening to this and you've never been exposed to traction or EOS, uh, just go on Amazon right now, buy EOS, buy, uh, buy traction. traction. And, uh, and again, really would encourage you if it's something that interests you, bring in an implementer as soon as possible. So you don't waste years of your leadership journey. <laughs> um, you, you talked about also taking people through the E leap, which I, I believe is the entrepreneurial leap. <clears throat> There's a lot of leaders who are listening to this that Maybe they feel like they have an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but they're in an organization. They don't feel fulfilled, but they're kind of afraid to make the leap. They're not sure if they really are have the chops to become an entrepreneur. What advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs, whether they're in an organization or just you know thinking about launching? Yeah, go to e-leap.com and take the assessment. We have an assessment mm -hmm. on there that'll help you understand: Are you really cut out for this entrepreneurial journey? Because there's so much to it. You know, let's just take like a really simple example. You make cupcakes and everybody says, you make the best cupcakes. You should open a cupcake store. And then they say it enough and you start thinking, I ought to do that. I really do like making cupcakes. I'm going to go open a cupcake store. And you go up in a cupcake store and you realize you're just dedicated your life to making very little money, hypothetically, unless you blow this things up, this business up and you take your cupcakes nationally and they're in, in all the different markets and, and all of a sudden you have this hugely complex business that at some point you were just making cupcakes for your friends and family. <laughs> so are you up wow. for that? Like, do you really want to make the sacrifices that go along with that? And are you willing to take your passion for making these amazing cupcakes and complicate it with turning it into a business? And if you are, please go do it. I want you to because you will be so fulfilled. But just check yourself because sometimes it looks shinier than it usually <laughs> is. Becoming an entrepreneur is hard work. You will have to dedicate so much energy to it. And uh, it's just, it's a really important gut check before you jump in. And nowadays, you know, with all the famous entrepreneurs and the TV shows like Shark Tank and things like that, everybody wants, you know, I shouldn't say everybody that's too broad, but so many people young and older alike, you know, they really see that as I can do that. You know, I want to be an entrepreneur. Nowadays, including myself, people refer to themselves as entrepreneurs. You know, back in the day, you owned a business and it was image one or it was the 10 disciplines. And that's what you were, a business owner. Uh, but now people, you know, they're, they're going through entrepreneurial programs. All the main universities have them now. So it's a very, uh, it, it, it's a profession that people look to and we want to help them. Actually, we want to convince them not to do it. So we save them 10 years of help. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, as you've worked with so many entrepreneurs, I'm sure you've seen some go off and thrive, others miss it. Where do you see entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs miss it most often? They, they believe it's going to be easier than it is. And I, mm. this is, these are some of my favorite fun, funny things to say is they run out and make a website, get business cards and buy gear. 
like hats and shirts <laughs> and they have their logos and they spend all this time ruminating over those the logo and before they ever sold a thing. And there's a great program, an entrepreneurial program. I think it's like the number one entrepreneurial program in the, in the world called Strategic Coach. And the founder of that program, Dan Sullivan, I went through that program and he always said, go get people to write the check. Back then people wrote checks, you know, and so... Um, you know, go get people to write the check, get people buying your cupcakes before you get too uh, involved with, you know, uh, all the details around having the perfect logo, the perfect website, the perfect, uh, you know, cards and things like that. Like go, go see if people really want to buy this product, then refine all the rest of this stuff, build it up slowly, really test it out before you invest all your time and money and energy into what this business is. That's so good. I have to ask just because you mentioned strategic coach. I'm a huge Dan Sullivan fan. I've never personally gone through coach. What has been the greatest lesson uh, or that you've applied in your life from Dan or coach? There's been many lessons. You know, one of them is time management and taking time off. Um, so that's one. And, and just re, you know, making sure you sort of allow your mind and body to rejuvenate. And that's a really key thing that many leaders and entrepreneurs do not do. They're always thinking about their organization and their business. So that's one. And the other one is called the gap. And that's where you're here now and you 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 started here, you want to be there, and you're somewhere in the middle, and you still feel unfulfilled, and you don't take the time to realize how far you've actually come on your way to going over to whatever your end goal is. And so sometimes you're stuck in the gap, and it's important to recognize that and take a step back and really appreciate what you've accomplished. Yeah. Um Back to the entrepreneurial journey. I am curious. So once you launch a company, you can start to scale eventually. And again, it takes leadership to start something. Um, but eventually, as you scale, your business is a great example. Uh, you know, I, well, one, I'd be curious, do you feel like all entrepreneurs can scale to the level that you all have scaled at Image One um, leadership wise? Or do some entrepreneurs have to eventually hand off the business? Uh, but, but really what I'm interested in, and where do you see leaders missing it? most often in their entrepreneurial journeys. Uh, their identity is caught up in the business and they truly believe they can go to the next level. And so in my, I'll just share my own personal experience. I realized that for us to go meet where we wanted to go for our vision, I was not the right person to do that. I also had to heart, have a heart to heart uh, meeting with my best friend and business partner, Joel, to convince him that I wasn't, and by the way, neither was he, and that we needed to find somebody. And I realized that back in 2016, and we spent time thoughtfully and intentionally, you know, speaking with people and really trying to find the right person who could continue to cultivate and lead our culture, but actually take the business to another level, because I just knew we were not capable of doing it. We hit the ceiling and we didn't have the energy to want to break through the ceiling. And so just mm. know thyself and it's okay. If you built a company to whatever it is and you're kind of like, you know, you're kind of stagnant. If you want to keep going, bring in key people. I mean, it's all about the types of people you surround yourself and don't be afraid to hand it off. You don't have to have all the answers and be very self-aware if your identity is caught up in the fact that when you walk in, you're the person with all the answers and that feeds you. I want to encourage you to maybe rethink that a little bit. Okay. That, that's super easy to say as we're talking, <laughs> True. But, but, but to live that out uh, in reality, I am curious how you either prepared for that or process that emotionally and your business partner. Because... I think almost every leader in the planet finds their value in what they do and to actually come to the knowledge that, Hey, I'm not, I mean, I think a lot of people struggle with just the fact that, Hey, am I enough? And they spend so much time trying to prove it. And a lot of times it's like their title or whatever position they have does. Yeah. What did it take for you to lay that down and, and process? Was it have some, having something to look forward to? Was it just getting to a place in your life where you were confident? Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, a million little things, to be honest with you. But some of <laughs> sure. the things that come to mind is first, 
why am I doing what I'm doing? And is it outer world focused? So is the outer world, what I think I'm supposed to be doing, what I'm getting from say my team members, the energy that that is, what I'm getting from growing the business, is that outer world focused? The other thing is noticing, am I truly serving my team? So for example, in my case, if we couldn't meet our vision that our whole team was trying to move towards because I wasn't a sufficient enough elite leader to do that, am I really serving them or am I holding them back? And that was something I really needed to be mindful about. And so some of the ways that I cultivate that in my life is through a meditation practice, which I do daily, twice per day. And that helps me you know, notice what's going on in my mind and not really try to solve anything, but just allow that to be and float by like clouds in the sky, so to speak. But I am noticing the sensations also during the, my practice in my body and what's coming up for me in my body. And when I'm frustrated or when I feel like I'm not enough, what's, where's that coming from? Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I need to contemplate and investigate that more. And so these are just some of the things and some of the questions that I ask myself, and maybe some of the listeners might be interested in asking themselves or not. <laughs> it just depends where you are <laughs> on your journey. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you mentioned it was 2016 when you kind of laid that down and you all hired. Was that right? 2016? That's when we determined that oh, we okay. needed to make a change, but that took time. And it wasn't until 2018 that we were able to do that. Okay. So 2018, you lay that down. Now you have you know five years to look back on that. And you mentioned earlier when we started that you now have a self-managing company. Um, is it freeing to know that, hey, you know, you had to go through that process, but looking back now, would you have it any other way? And then two, uh, what is a self-managing company and why, and why is that something leaders should strive for? Well, so to, to answer your first question, and if I forget your second question, please remind me, but <laughs> yep, to yep. answer your first question, uh, as I look back on it, I am proud of it, actually. Um, you know, I, we put this idea of needing the right kind of person to show up in our life. So something that Joel and I did that I feel is a little different is we just, as we say, put it out there. We started, you know, letting people know that, that we're in our networks and in our peer groups, that we were just looking for the right person, but we didn't hire a recruiter and try to, you know, have somebody hired within the next 90 days. We were patient and we really paid close attention in our lives to the people that we were coming into contact. And we met many people over that two year period of time. But when our current CEO uh, came into our lives, his name is Josh Britton. I had a feeling, it was just an intuitive feeling, this guy is special. Now we brought him in slowly, he ran our operations for a while. And so we saw how we worked together. And is this person really somebody who can, we can have a clear succession plan? Once we were clear with, the, with, the, with that within, I would say 12 to 18 months, we put a succession plan into place and we shared that with the company. Now, we certainly had a unique circumstances where we went through, you know, the pandemic together, which was quite impactful for our company. And that's where Josh really started to shine and where it really made sense to everybody in our team that this guy can lead and then handing it over to him completely uh, last year, I think it was. Uh, so he's been running the company fully as CEO for about a year and a half now. Um, and so, yes, I think it was thoughtful and intentional and well communicated um, to the team. Now, I think the second question is, why would you want that? And I would say, I don't know if you do. That's really up to you. Wow. You know, for, for me, that was important because I hit my ceiling and there were other things I felt like I wanted to do in my business career and in my life. And I was ready for something different, as was Joel. So um, I think that's just, ha you know, um, paying attention to yourself and recognizing, you know, do you have the same energy? And I'm not talking about like physical energy. I'm just talking about like the energy that's within you 
where you're, as Gino and I like to say, you're floating, F-L-O-W-T, which is, <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing your such great work. It feels mm. like, you know, you're just in flow. It feels like you're floating. And so the question is, do, is that how you feel every day? Because if you don't, I, I really want to encourage you to take a step back as much as you can, slow down, get silent, and go inside and see what the messages really are. Sometimes they come right away. Sometimes they take years. And just be patient, but pay close attention because there's something pinging you and you just might not be paying attention to it. And without slowing down and getting quiet, you're never going to hear it. Wow. Uh, well, you mentioned you wanted freed up because you felt like there was other things you wanted to pursue. Uh, you've already mentioned you're doing work around the 10 disciplines with Gino. Can I do want to dive into those because uh, I think they're so good. But can you kind of give people the origin of, of the 10 disciplines and why this is important for them? Yeah. So again, back to Gino and my relationship. Uh, after we started working together, we became friends and we would meet for coffee like every 90 days for a half a day. And we would just catch up like no, no big agenda, not business. We would talk business, but we'd really talk more personal. But one of the things I noticed with Gino <laughs> is, you know, much like the EOS process, much like what is outlined in traction, he had a very particular way of leading his life, you know, as I, re as I related to how you lead your company. And so I would ask him things, you know, like he would say things like, um, yes, I'm taking all of August off. And I'd say, really, how are you doing that? That's fascinating. <laughs> or he'd say, I don't do that kind of work. I delegate that. And I'd say, really, hmm. how, how, what, how, how are you doing that? And, you know, and he would explain these different things. And I'd go back to my office and I'd think about our conversation and I'd say, wow, that's really good. I'm going to try that. <laughs> so all these things he was telling me, they were an unorganized version of the 10 disciplines. And one mm. day, one day he got inspired and he wrote them all down. And he, and, and th then he came and he said, you know what, these are 10 disciplines that I've been living by. And I said, thank you so much for this because I've been gleaning this one and that one from you. And I didn't really know what I was doing. And now in a sense, you've You've made it organized like you did with traction and you've explained how to go about doing it. And I said to him, we ought to take this to the world because this mm -hmm. I've been using it in an informal way before you ever documented it. And it made a huge difference in my life, like taking time off. I never took four weeks off, but I'd take four, uh, I'd take uh, two to three weeks off and really be off the grid with my family when my kids were young. Um, and that was so re that was so energizing for me. And everyone, all my peers would say, how are you doing that? What are you doing? That's crazy. What's going on back at the business? Aren't you worried? And I would say, no, Gino taught me that. And it was a huge difference in my life. So just things like that. And so here we are, we've, we've created a program and, and we teach it to entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, and, uh, we're just having a blast doing it. Yeah, we haven't exactly pointed them out, but you've already mentioned several of them throughout the interview. Yeah. But I do want to take a little deeper dive into the take time off, um, whether it's a month. You, you mentioned that was one of the big takeaways from Strategic Coach for you was just taking time to rejuvenate. For leaders listening to this who, who may sound like uh, the people that interacted you when you came back and said, how do you do that? How do I? I can't take that. Yeah. What would you encourage? How much time do leaders need to take off? What kind of buffers can they build into their uh, rhythms in their annual calendar yeah. to, to refresh? So we, our hope for leaders, entrepreneurs, is that they will commit to taking at least 130 days off per year. Okay, so 130 days. So let's put it in perspective. If you took every weekend, both days off, if you took every US holiday and three weeks vacation, that equals darn near close to 130. So most people go, oh, okay. But here's <laughs> where it gets a little tricky because what we teach is and not think about work the entire time, mm. which means on Saturday and Sunday, you're not catching up on emails or catching up on industry news, et cetera. 
uh, on vacation, you're not checking in with the office or cleaning up your emails on a little break or while you're on the plane. Um, and, and on holidays, you're fully with your family, whether you like that or not. <laughs> That's how you spend your holidays. And, and so we, we really want you, as I mentioned earlier, to clear your mind, re-energize your body, and you will come back stronger. You will come back refreshed. You'll have better ideas than you already have. You'll treat people better because you will be in a better state of mind. <clears throat> so, you know, this is the next part of what I like to share with people that they have trouble with is why, especially with technology, <clears throat> why do they feel drawn, especially to their phones? And what I've learned is it's filling a gap when you're bored. And so mm. it's just really hard. Like, let's say you're, it's the weekend and you have, let's just say you have children and you go to their uh, soccer game or their baseball game or basketball, whatever the sport is. And you're watching it. How many times do you take out your phone and check your email real quick? Now, what's going on with that? And then how many times is it actually productive? Or are you <laughs> clearing email and trying to make yourself feel less stressed? Like you have, you have 10 less emails than you had before or so what is going on? You know, so that's where you have to take a look inside and really start asking yourself, what is going on? Why can't I be, quote unquote, bored? Why can't I be in the present moment? Why am I always looking for something else to entertain me as opposed to whatever I'm doing at this mm -hmm. moment? And so these are some of the questions that we present to people when we take them through this idea of taking off, taking time off. And we encourage you to think about ways that you can uh, learn more in this world. Like, so what are hobbies? What are things that you might do if work wasn't involved? And just consider that, jot them down. Who are people that you might spend more time with if work wasn't involved and start to just take yourself through this process of slowly segueing what it feels like to just let it all go and be free for 24, 48 hours. Or if you really get brave, as we, you and I have been talking about, a full sabbatical, four Come weeks on. with nothing and no interaction with business. Life goals. We're, I'm at two weeks right now a year, and that's uh, that's been delightful. But yeah, a month would be awesome. I would love to um, see you get there, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Let's get I'll, I'll, I'll email you when I do. Uh, okay. As I look over the other disciplines, I do feel like, because people still may be saying, well, how do I do that? But I think some of the other disciplines can actually feed into you having time off. Uh, and I'll just throw a few out there that I'd love to hear you just elaborate on. One is just say no often. <laughs> and I think that's one reason we probably can't take time off is we never stop saying yes. Yes. So can you, can you say more about yeah. that? Yeah. And, and by the way, you're so right. It's observant, Doug, because all the disciplines are interconnected. They are mm. strongest when working together. So you might take a little one here and a little one there. They move the needle a little, but when you bring them all together, hence the disciplines, they are so powerful. And so saying no often. So first of all, you know, there are books that teach you to say yes to everything. And maybe if you're in an early stage of your career, maybe the right thing to do is to say yes to everything. Mm. But I'm wow. guessing the people that are listening to your podcast, these are leaders that have a little bit more... Uh, established. And, and so now we have to make choices. And these choices are really important. We need clarity in our lives around what's going to make the greatest impact with my time. That is your most valuable asset. Funny thing is, you know this already. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but yet you still say yes. <laughs> Why? Maybe you have FOMO. You fear you might miss out on something. And how many times do we justify it? We say, well, what could it hurt to go have coffee? No big deal. Yes, big deal. It's 20 minutes to get to the coffee shop. It's an hour to spend with the person. It's 20 minutes back. It wasn't an hour. It was almost two hours by the time you get settled back in. You know, there. If you work eight hours, that's 25% of your day. 
Was that the best usage of your time? Was it high gain for you? We like to do favors and look good. That's not always the best approach for us. Let's serve uh, let's serve our team. Let's serve our organizations in the way that we know best. Let's serve our families. You know, how how many times are we running around not present with our family, yet we're taking, you know, meetings that after we're done, we're like, what was that all about? Why did I do that? You know, sometimes we volunteer for things. And if you're passionate about it, and I know you have a nonprofit that you run and your volunteers are key to them and you want them to be passionate and engaged. But some people show up because somebody asked them and they're really not that passionate about it. Is that the best usage of your time and energy? These are just questions I'm posing for your listeners to consider. I don't have the answers, but if you're saying, if you're not saying no often, You're saying yes to way too much because you do not have enough time to do it all well. So scale it back, open up time in your mind, space in your mind, time in your life so you can be in your sweet spot. And there's not a lot in your sweet spot. It's very finite. So stay there and make sure what you're saying yes to is what is keeping you in that sweet spot. That's so good. And everyone needs to hear that. It's funny when you mentioned FOMO, I have a friend, a mentor, I have four young children. I have a mentor friend who also has four children. He's a little further ahead in the journey. And he said his wife started coining the phrase Jomo, which is the joy, (laughs) the joy of missing out. And, uh, that's As so they good, had to learn to way. say no. Oh, 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 I've adopted that for sure. And that's helped me so much. It's like, hey, I would much rather spend this night with my kids than go yes. do some, some networking thing that's not going to pay off in the long run. Uh, another discipline you mentioned that I love is don't do $25 an hour work. This is yeah. so challenging. Can again, you expound yeah, on that? I know. And again, totally interconnected. And $25 yeah. an hour work, by the way, I just want to mm-hmm. say there's nothing wrong with $25 an hour work. And it's important work. And there are people that are great at doing it. I'm just guessing it's not you, Doug, it's not me, and it's not your listeners. And what I like to encourage people to do is take their annual compensation and divide it by the number of hours you're working, which if you're a leader, you're probably working at least 50, 60, 70, 80 hours. You're not working 40 or 30, probably. Now divide your annual compensation by those total number of hours you're working and look at what your hourly rate is. It's going to shock you, actually. I probably, hmm. People are like, whoa, I didn't realize that. Okay. So now you have your hourly rate. So now you got to look at what's on my plate. What am I doing? And you're looking and you're saying, I'm answering emails. I'm managing my calendar. Why am I doing that? Why am I booking travel? Why am I coordinating things that need to get done at my house? Even personal things is what I'm talking about. And start pulling those things off your plate. When you delegate that and pay, and nowadays it's easier than ever because there are so many people that are freelance, mm. they're, they work remote and they're working from home. They love it. They want to serve a leader like you, like me. They just love it. Anything you want them to do, they're happy to do it. And so by getting those things up off your plate, it, it creates more energy because in your sweet spot, you're doing things that drives your energy. That's what you should be doing, not things that drain your energy. I don't know about you. I don't like looking at emails that does not make my energy (laughs) flow. It drains me, okay? I don't like scheduling meetings on my calendar. It drains me. I get anxious when somebody says, you know, pull out your calendar. I don't want to do that. (laughs) So these are just two examples. I could go on and on about it, but you know what I'm talking about as do your listeners. And so, yeah. Okay. So now next thing that many leaders and entrepreneurs get kind of caught up with is, you know, well now that's another budget item. And I think that I want to challenge that thinking and I want you to hopefully believe that anything you delegate out that's $25, $35, $40 an hour work, that you're going to get a five times return on that. Like you have to believe in yourself that you're going to use that freed up time to go create uh, more value in this world, whether it's growing the nonprofit or your your for-profit business or whatever it is, 
I hope that you have enough belief in yourself that you can say, no, you know what? That's a good investment actually for me to do that. For me to have my, if you have an EA, let's say, to have them coordinate somebody to come fix your shower because it broke at your, at your house instead of you getting on the phone and trying to do that. So these are the kinds of things that we're taking people through and teaching them how to do uh, for that, for all the, these types of disciplines. Yeah. And leaders, if you're listening, I just want to echo that. I, I didn't have an executive assistant forever. I think I heard Dan Sullivan say like, we won't even let you in coach if you don't have one or someone said something like that. But, <laughs> Never heard that. That's but, uh, uh, but, but yeah, hiring one was an absolute game changer for me. And it's exactly what you said. It's an investment and the ROI goes up 10 X on your time. So um, with the time we have left, I want to transition, but if people were interested in learning more about the 10 disciplines uh, or the entrepreneurial leap, where can they find you? Where can they connect with you and take next steps? First of all, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, E-leap.com. E that's for the academy. And the10disciplines.com. And you can type 10 or, or use the number. It doesn't matter. The10disciplines.com is where you would find information about that coaching program. Wonderful. And we'll include links to all of those things and anything else that we mentioned in the show notes. So make sure you check it out there, leaders, if you want to see it. So lightning round, a bunch of fun questions I ask in every interview. And the first one is, what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Well, it was. it's hard for me to answer that because there's so many pieces <laughs> of advice that it's like a million little things, like I said earlier. But one recently that's really resonated with me it came from a friend named Ryan Westrom, and he said to me, serious, not so serious. Serious, not so serious. <laughs> and I see the confusion on you. Yeah, say more, say more. Yeah. Say more. So what that means is things are serious, but they're not so serious. So you have to find the middle ground, the middle way. And that's what's so impactful is because sometimes we get so weighed down with what we think is so serious, say like what's going on within our organization. But at the end of the day, it's not so serious. So mm. <laughs> serious, not so serious, somewhere in the middle. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? I would say slow down, slow down, not driving, slow down in your life. Yeah. And I don't have time to dive into the seat, but you wrote a book called Do Nothing, <laughs> <laughs> I did. which again, for a leadership podcast and leaders listening to that, they're saying what? And a lot of it's around meditation. Can you just give us a brief pitch for, for why leaders should do nothing and slow down? I encourage them in the book to slow down, just like everything I've been sharing with you, allow your mind to settle. I always like to use this idea of sand imagine a jar filled with sand and water and you shake it up. That's your mind. Okay. It's fuzzy. You can't see through it. When you set it down and the sand settles, the water's clear. You can see through it. That's mm -hmm. us slowing down. That's, that's wow. what that looks like. And so we want, I, I want to encourage you to allow your mind to settle, allow your body to rejuvenate because the mind and the body are connected and you will be a better human being, I promise you. <laughs> uh, other than traction, uh, what's one book either that you've read in the last year or all time that has made a huge impact on your life? Honestly, the most impactful book, and there's been so many, but the one I recommend the most is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor mm. Frankl. That's good. Uh, you get to spend time with a lot of great leaders. I'm curious, when you do, do you have a go-to question or two if you get a dinner that you always ask? I always like to ask them, how are you? How are you really? So we don't have the, I'm good. Yeah, no, all's good. Yeah, business good. How are you really? Go into your heart. Tell me how you really are. Wow. I love that. Um, I don't know if you have an actual bucket list or not. I'm sure you've had a lot of cool experiences in life. What's something you, you have done that you believe everyone should do before they die? Uh... <laughs> I think that um, I didn't. I didn't. I don't really have a good answer for that, so that's why I laughed um, because I think we're all so unique in in an individualistic way. So I'm going to leave that one to your listeners to think about. I, I'm passing on that question because I really don't feel like there's one thing that I have done that it's going to resonate with everybody. We're so unique, 
you know, I mean, I could go the gamut on that one. So I hope you, I hope you let me off the hook on that one. You're off the hook. Thank you. Uh, if you could go back and have coffee with yourself at any age and you actually would have listened to yourself, what age would you meet with yourself and what would you tell yeah, that I, version of Rob? I feel like it would be in those in, instrumental teen years. And I would just say that, you know, don't be too focused on what the outer world is thinking. Hmm. And one day looking back on your leadership journey, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your leadership legacy to be? Well, I hope that I'm not too concerned with that. You know, I thought a little bit about that question, but, you know, I, I hope that I could show up in this life as somebody who is loving in an unconditional way. Hmm. Biggest leadership pet peeve? People that don't listen. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what's something about your journey that uh, people may be interested to know that they may not? <laughs> Another great one. I don't think I, I never want to say anybody's interested in any part of my journey. But what I will say is, as an entrepreneur, I'll just say that part. Um, yeah. And we talked about this early on. It is, it's hard. It's, it's, it's a dedicated, you know, you have to dedicate yourself to it and just know that it, it's, it's hard. And so oftentimes I think we see people who have had some measure of success and it almost seems like it's easy. And you hear things like, well, yeah, easy for you now that you, you know, but you know, it's, it's hard work, whether you're successful or not, it's always hard. In a really yeah, good way, though. I don't want to make that sound depressing. It's actually in a really good way. The hard work is what this is all about. This is why we're doing it. We love it. We love solving the problems. We love mm -hmm. building and creating. And and uh, that's what we're made for. We're driven. So good. Uh, Open-ended. Anything else you want to leave leaders with today? Well, I would say... I, I just, what I just said actually at the end, I like to say, please know that you're driven. You have a unique gene and you're only in the 10% of the entire population. So know that. Also know that you're making all of your decisions from love or fear. And I want to encourage you to start tapping into making them from a place of love. And finally, please know that you can be driven and have peace in your life. And so they're not mutually exclusive. Your driven gene isn't what's making you more successful. And, and so you don't have to hold tightly onto that without peace. So you can be driven and have peace. And that's what we try to teach people in our program. Wow. Well, Rob, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for thank adding you, value Doug. to me and everyone that will listen to this. And yeah, hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to chat with me. You're the best.